Hey friends, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Mariah and this is Mariah's Moods. So in this video, we are going to be going over my quarterly wrap up. So this year I've been really, really bad about filming a wrap up of my reading each month. I started putting a quick little wrap up in the beginning of my TBR videos, but I wanted to sit down and go over all of the books that I've read in the months of January, February, and March, so the first three months of the year. I've got some stats to kind of go through and then talk about each of the books that I read and my feelings on them. So I think for 2024, the year is going by like so far so good. Um, I haven't really read everything that I've been wanting to read so far this year or getting to all of my TBR for this year. But I do think that overall what I have been picking up and reading, I've been enjoying pretty good. I think I've got a couple of five-star reads so far, which I think is fantastic. And I am on track to meeting my Goodreads goal for the year. So without further ado, let's go ahead and hop into the stats and then we'll get into the actual books. Okay, so first off, how many books have I read? So in the first quarter of the year, for January, February, and March, I've read a total of 24 books, um, which I think is great, but I really would have liked to have a couple of more books Books to that number but based on my goal of reading I think I said 75 books at the end of the year Goodreads tells me that I'm ahead of schedule so I'm feeling good about that total pages that I've read this year so far for this quarter is 10,276 pages which when you put up the page count I feel pretty good I feel pretty good that's a lot um, on average, so based on each month and the number of pages I've read, so my average pages per day is about 116. I would say that that's mm, probably close to what I read on average daily, but I definitely know that there are some days that I was like reading way more and some days that I didn't read at all. So I think it's a fair average, but it doesn't really represent a day-to-day basis for me. So my average page count for this quarter was about 428 pages, which I think I think that fits. There's definitely some longer books that I've read, but there's also some very short books that I read, especially in the month of March. Now what I think is very interesting, and when I look at it, it definitely makes sense, but when I just kind of reflect on the first couple of months of the year, I wouldn't have picked this as my overarching like genre, but my most read genre for this quarter has been fantasy romance. And like, just like, that doesn't sound right, but I mean like, it is, unless I'm just categorizing these books wrong, um, I wouldn't have thought that I was reading mostly fantasy romance, but apparently I have been. <laughs> now let's move on to the star breakdown. For this quarter, I have read a total of eight five-star books, which I think is fantastic. And honestly, before filming this, I went back and I thought about them and I think they're solid. I think they fit for the five star. Now I will say that this chart does round up just like on Goodreads, I'll round up. So some of them are probably 4.5 stars, but I'll just give them the five star for like Goodreads and I'm okay with that. So yeah, I think that there's a couple of 4.5s, but still several solid five stars for me. So then from there, I have seven four star reads, six three stars, three two stars, and no one star reads. I rarely give a book one star. Like if it's going to be a one star, I'm just, I'm just DNFing that book. Um, so on average, I have a 3.83 like average star rating for the books that I've read. And I think that that's fair. I've definitely had some really great ones. I've had some okay ones and a couple of like, just like Meh. I've read two new releases so far, 16 on the backlist, and six that were just released last year in 2023. So when I look at my format breakdown, I majority read physical books, which is pretty on par, um, and two were strictly audio, and then eight of them were mixed media, which is also pretty typical of me. Um, I tend to read mostly physical, but then if I'm busy or doing something, I'll put on the audiobook to continue on with the story. I'm also a mom of four, so I'm very busy all of the time, so I don't always have time to just sit and read exclusively my physical book. So I do like to do a lot of mixed media between um, the physical reading, and the audio and sometimes late at night I'll put it on my Kindle so I can continue reading without having to have all of the light around me as well. And I did read three exclusive ebooks so far, which I feel like is pretty low. Um, I'm usually like constantly on KU reading stories. So I find that pretty interesting, but then when I look at the stack of books, 
I've been really trying to read off of my shelves, especially with my TBR game. So it makes sense for me to have more physical reads and not as many ebooks. Okay, so for the series breakdown, which I really like about this, is that I have actually started nine series so far. That to me is a problem because the thing is, is that I really love to read the first books of series, but I tend not to be like a series binger. Like when I finish a book, I kind of need to step away from it for a minute. It's very rare that I immediately pick up the next book in a series. So who knows when I will actually get caught up in any of these series that I've read so far. I have finished one series or I'm caught up to that series and I'm not even really sure if it will be continued. So it is on the completed side, but then I do have three that I'm currently caught up on that I'm waiting for the next release, which is promising. So when I look at the genre breakdown, my most read genre was fantasy romance, which I've already mentioned. And then after that was actually middle grade, which makes sense because March, I participated in middle grade March and read a Total, I think of five middle grade books, four or five middle grade books for middle middle grade March, which will probably be probably all the middle grade that I'll read for the year unless I pick up one on just like a whim. Um, so that does make sense for the quarter. After that, I had five romance novels. Am I like I'm? Am I turning into a romance girly because this is new? This is new for me. Um, I had. Three fantasy, just like true fantasy. Then I had two dark romances, and then one thriller, one sci fi, and one horror. The thriller honestly kind of makes me a little disappointed. I tend to really enjoy thrillers and read them pretty frequently. So for me to only have one kind of motivates me to pick up some more thrillers in the next quarter. So now what we're going to do is go ahead and talk about each book I've read so far this year, and I've divided it by month, and I figured I would just go chronologically um, for each book. So for the month of January, I read a total of nine books. I have eight physical books here. One book I read through the library on my Kindle, which I don't have a copy with me, but let's go ahead and go through each one of these books. I started off by reading Rhoda Bones by Christopher Golden, um, and I ended up giving this two stars. This one was a huge disappointment. I was very excited to read this. I mean, the cover is stunning. It does have a lot of water damage because I fell asleep and dropped it in the bathtub. I think that kind of, you know, is a good indicator of how I felt about this book. Uh, but oh, that cover is just so stunning. I wanted it to be just as good as the cover is. Unfortunately for me, it was not. So this book is following Teague, who is a like paranormal documentary like filmmaker, and he's traveling to a remote area in Siberia, one of the coldest inhabited areas on Earth, and it's built along this road of bones that was put together by um, Soviet Union prisoners, prisoners of war, or criminals, um, and it's just rumored to be haunted because as they were building this road, and as the prisoners were like perishing they were just like building this road on top of them and so it's rumored to be haunted and he is a paranormal filmmaker and him and his best friend go out there and just basically try and get some footage to bring back and pitch this idea of creating a documentary on the road of bones sounds really great right sounds really interesting sounds like it's going to be creepy and weird things are going to happen and it's going to be scary and cold and atmospheric but that was not the case here. I will give it to Christopher Golden. It was really good as far as their atmosphere goes. I was reading this and I felt cold. I felt the chill and the bitterness. And I definitely think that he really hit the mark with that one. But the problem for me was the plot. This book was pitched in the way that I just pitched it to you, but that is not in fact what happens and where the story goes. Honestly, the road of bones and the lore behind it was just a footnote in like the first couple of chapters and they get out there and they have this guide and they stumble upon this village and the village just seems to be completely abandoned and the only one there is like this little girl who's basically like catatonic like she's just kind of sitting there and she won't speak and they can't figure out what happened and it looks like people literally just like left their lives like Food is left out on the table. Um, you know, nothing is packed up. Nothing is missing. It just looks like people literally stood up and walked out of this village, and they can't figure out why. Again, that is given to us, but, like, the answers 
didn't make sense. Um, weird things were happening, but in a way that there really wasn't a lot of foreshadowing, not a lot of explanation. Um, and then at the very end, it just kind of dives into, I guess, like, Siber like Siberian lore that unless you know of those stories, it really doesn't make sense and it's very, very confusing. And I just feel like the author should have done a better job about leading up to the lore and the explanation and not assuming that the readers are going to know anything about this. And even if that lore is in fact true, it could have been just in the story. It just started off as one bit and moved on to something else and not in a good way. For me at least. So I did end up giving this a 2 out of 5 stars. I wish it would have been better. But you know, you live and you learn. So following Rota Bones, I picked up My Roommate is a Vampire by Jenna Levine. I ended up giving this 3 out of 5 stars. I thought it was cute. It was a little fun. Kind of, I wouldn't even want to say like fantasy or paranormal romance. It felt very contemporary, but you know, one of like the main love interest is a vampire. So this is following Cassie, who's just kind of like down on her luck. She's having some financial issues and she needs to move out of her current apartment. And she's just like a little reckless, I guess I would say. She gets online and she finds an ad for an apartment in a really, really nice area for a very, very cheap price. And that does not ring red flags for her. She's like, listen, I have no other options. I can afford this one and I'm moving in. Her best friend's kind of like, Okay, let me know if you're alive. Like, let me, we need to do check-ins because this does not sound okay. But she ends up going through it and she meets her new roommate, Frederick, who is very, very odd. He works very, very odd hours. He is, basically works at night, sleeps in the day, but she works during the day. So they kind of like perfect scenario. We're not going to kind of cross paths very much. Um, he realizes that he did not actually mean to post the price that he meant. He's terrible with technology, but he honors the agreement and just basically agrees to have this roommate. Um, and so she moves in and she realized that Frederick is very, very strange and she's kind of got a little bit of weird vibes from him. But when she finds some blood bags in his refrigerator, he basically has to admit that he is in fact a vampire and she has to deal with that. But he's pretty hot and he's got a proposition for her. This book was really, really cute. Um, I liked the dynamic between Cassie and Frederick. I mean, it's nothing that I was like swooning over or, you know, think back on very frequently, but it was definitely a great palate cleanser following the Road of Bones issue. Um, so overall, I gave it a three out of five stars. I would highly recommend. It's a cute little contemporary paranormal romance, whatever you want to call it fun ride, cute cover. Um, so I do recommend this one. So honestly, after that, after that point, I was still just like very disappointed in my reading year so far. I had a terrible book that I didn't enjoy. I had an okay little romance, but I definitely, definitely redeemed myself with this next read. And I moved on to Malice by John Gwynn. I ended up giving this five stars. It was fantastic. I loved it. This is an epic fantasy. This is the first book of the Faithful and the Fallen series. It was, it was just great. It was so great. But basically, this is following a cast of characters that live in the Banished Lands. And long, long time ago, there was this epic war between men and giants. And men basically won out, and the giants all but disappeared. But in recent times in our current story, uh, the giants are starting to kind of be awoken again. And there's all of these other weird experiences and basically signs that the war of all wars are coming. The war to end all wars is on this way. So King Aquilus, I think that was his name, basically calls up all of his other fellow kings to kind of come up with a plan on what they should do. So some people are kind of skeptical about these signs. Some people are on board. Um, but there is this prophecy that basically says that there is going to be this bright star and this black sun. They have to stop this black sun because if the black sun rises to power, that basically is going to end everything that they love and they cherish and pretty much end everything for them. When I tell you that's just like the surface of this book, it was so fantastic. I think that the characters were written great. I loved and thought about every single character and I was invested in each of these storylines. I think the plot was well paced and just just expertly written, the writing and the storytelling and the interactions. It was just fantastic. This is a five out of five stars. 
Honestly, I cannot believe I haven't picked up the next book. I have it on my shelves waiting for me. I think I'm just like still on a high from reading Malice, but I definitely want to go on with the series ASAP. Highly, highly recommend. Please read it. After Malice, I was a little bit of a slump, didn't really know what to read, so I thought I would just go ahead and pick up something a little lighter and a little more fun. So I read Almost There by Farah broken and I ended up giving this a three out of five stars as well. This is a middle grade, maybe like more mature middle grade, um, more of a younger YA audience. This is a retelling or a twisted tale of uh, Princess and the Frog, Tiana from the classic Disney movie. Um, and so basically what this is, is this is giving us an alternate ending to the story of Princess and the Frog. So what if certain things were to happen? And so in this case for Almost There, it's what if Tiana made a deal that changed everything? So in our story, it starts at the end of the movie, the Princess and the Frog. And instead of Tiana banishing the Shadow Man, she makes a deal with him to get her her dream restaurant, but also bring her father back to life. And so the story is just following the repercussions of making that deal and what it means to you know, change your fate and make that with the, you know, make a deal with a shady person. And it was really enjoyable. I really liked it. I do think, I do appreciate that the author took some time to address some of the things that I think Disney kind of fell short on in the original movie when we're talking about um, race relations, when we're talking about gender roles, and um, even things like cultural differences with voodoo and the representation of voodoo in the movie versus the book. I think the book did much better in that. So I think for me as an adult reader, I would give it a three out of five stars. Um, but I'm someone who believes that you can enjoy middle grade no matter what age you are. So I do highly recommend checking out Almost There. And honestly, I've read three of the Twisted Tales so far and I've enjoyed all of them. So if you're a Disney fan, I highly recommend the Twisted Tales, especially Almost There. So I wanted to continue on with my little like fairy tale vibes. And I actually had a vlog for that. So if you're interested in, you can definitely go look for that. Um, but I picked up Once Upon a Broken Heart by Stephanie Garber. This one was another little, like, kind of disappointing one for me. I think this one for me was just, like, so hyped on TikTok, on BookTube, on Instagram. Like, I saw it everywhere, and I was really hoping that I would really, really enjoy this one. But it was just kind of okay for me. I ended up giving it a 3 out of 5 stars. Um, I just wanted a little bit more. But we're following Evangeline who has recently lost her father and really gone close to someone that she feels like she loves. Well, she learns that the love of her life is actually going to marry her stepsister, and she is devastated. So she decides to get the help of Jax, also known as the Prince of Hearts, and he's basically this fate, almost like God, who the fates tend to kind of mingle and get involved with other people's lives. And the fates kind of have their own like realm that they deal with. It gives very much like the Greek mythology, you know, the god of war, the, you know, goddess of love and like all of that type of stuff. So Jax is the prince of hearts and he's kind of the one that deals with the broken hearts, as you, I guess you could say. And she runs to him and she's like, listen, I need your help. I need you to stop this wedding from happening. So he's like, fine, I'll help you. But you have to kiss three people um, of my choosing and when I say so. And she's desperate. So she just immediately is like, fine, yes, do it. Stop this wedding. Well, he does. And not in the way that she thought it would. And it basically causes um, a domino effect of con like things that happen in consequence to him interfering. Um, and I think that that was a good like starting point, but where the story went, I just didn't really enjoy. Like I really thought there would be more between the two, um, Evangeline and Jax, and I definitely think that we're leading up to that, but just like, I don't know. It was just okay. Um, and then it felt like at the end that a lot of information and a lot of plot was thrown at us, at least in my opinion, that I definitely see where it could lead someone to like pick up the next book and know where it's going to go. But it felt so rushed and it kind of felt out of nowhere. And I was left with a lot of questions, but like not in the sense of like what's going to happen. It's more so like what just happened and where did this come from? 
So I did give it a 3 out of 5 stars because there were some things that I did enjoy. Um, and I'm still on the fence on if I'm going to continue on with the series. And I wouldn't say not read it. Like I would recommend. I definitely think people like it. And it is a hyped book. So it is for someone. I just might not be that that reader. It just might not be for me. So also in January, I was prepping for the release of the third Crescent City book by Sarah J. Mass. So for that, I went ahead and read for the first time, the first two Crescent City books. I read The House of Earth and Blood and The House of Sky and Breath. I binge read these books because my friends and I went to the midnight release for House of Flame and Shadow. Um, so I started off by reading A House of Earth and Blood or Crescent City 1 by Sarah J. Mass. I gave this five stars. I gave it five stars. I gave it five stars. I loved this book. I really did love this book. Um, Bryce Quinlan in book one, I love to meet some Bryce. But what I really, really loved about this book is that it was urban fantasy and something that was so different than either of her other two series. And I really, really enjoyed that. I know that that's a criticism for some people. They didn't really like the urban fantasy, but I do love an urban fantasy. And I loved the just mixture of different creatures that we find in this world. This is following Bryce Quinlan, who is half human, half fae. And she has this best friend, Danica, who is like a shifter, um, like a were oh, like a wolf shelf shifter, um, but like tragedy strikes and just turns Bryce's world upside down, and she's left with just basically wanting to know what happened and why did it happen, and so she teams up with a angel, a fallen angel, Hunt, um, who is basically like a, I guess you could call detective in a sense. So Bryce and Hunt team up to investigate and try and get some answers to this tragedy and basically how it impacts the city as a whole. Um, this was great. <laughs> Did I already say that? Because I loved it. Um, really it was Bryce and a lot of the side characters and just the world building in this was a lot of fun. Um, Bryce is a badass. She's a badass, and I like it. She's sassy. She's independent. She's a little reckless and dangerous, but for a good reason. This girl has got some trauma, some serious trauma. And I just want to say, like, if you know, you know, but the vacuum had me hollering, Ho like, audibly hollering. Bryce motherfucking Quinlan. That's that's all I got to say. That's all I got to say. This was absolutely fantastic. I binged this one and was having the time of my life. So after that, obviously, I had to pick up A House of Sky and Breath. Now, this one, while it was enjoyable, it was not on the level as, of the first book, in my opinion. I ended up giving this four out of five stars. Um, I think what held up for me was all of the side characters. I really didn't I really love Bryce, but I really don't care for Bryce and Hunt, so I some of this just wasn't for me. Now, the slow burn was great, and, and I really didn't care for, like, where the plot was going, and I felt like there was, like, another mystery in this book that really wasn't necessary, I feel like, on a big scale. Like, I feel like she could have introduced the next stage of this plot using a different device, a different plot line. Um than the one that the mystery that she had in this one. Uh, but for me, it really was the side characters. I love Rune. I love uh, Rune. Rune? Rune Dannon. Oh, hoo, hoo, hoo. he had me blushing. He had me blushing on this one. Um, but I also loved Ethan and all of the other characters that we find. I mean, I still really enjoyed it, but you can definitely see the difference in tabs here. Um, so I still think it was a solid four star read. I think as a whole, I would still recommend reading both of the books, um, but it just didn't hit the same way that the first one did for me. So then I needed something to kind of calm myself down because I was hyped from Crescent City. I was hyped from Crescent City. I had a blast at the midnight premiere, but I just kind of needed something to woosah my brain. So I picked up Love on the Brain by Allie Hazelwood. <laughs> that was not planned. That was so cheesy, but it was not planned. 
So basically, this book is following B, who lives her life by the mantra of like, what would Marie Curie do? She has recently scored her dream job at NASA. She's an engineer, but she realizes that she has to work with Levi, who was her like grad school arch nemesis rival. Um, but as she's going through her research, she realizes that it's starting to be sabotaged, and Levi actually starts to turn into an ally, if not a little bit more. Um, this was this was good. I gave it three out of five stars. Um, it's not my favorite Allie Hazelwood, but I mean it's a classic Allie Hazelwood. You have the quirky female protagonist, you kind of have the broody male love interest. Um, you know, you come for Allie Hazelwood expecting something, and you're more than likely going to get it. Three out of five stars. I still will always say that Allie Hazelwood is one of my favorite romance authors. I just enjoy her, and I have a great time. So if you haven't gotten to Love on the Brain, I do recommend reading it. So then I moved into the month of February, and I'm really proud of myself because I did finish my TBR for February. And first time in its new TBR history, so... Go me, so excited. So in February, I read a total of nine books, and I had a great time. We started off strong with House of Flame and Shadow by Sarah J. Mass. This was the third book, the new release for the Crescent City series, hence why I read the first two books. Um, I binged this one, and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was good. Um, I loved the crossover. If you know, you know. If you don't, read it. I really loved, again, the side characters. That's something that I really love about Sarah J. Mass books is I am able to get invested in all of the characters. There's always a big cast of characters that have their own stories, have their own personalities, their plot lines. I feel like they're really flushed out and I enjoy all of them and I'm really invested in them and it's not just our main couple because honestly in this book Bryce and Hunt were like at the bottom. Like I just Bryce was still being Bryce and she was great but like Hunt was getting on my last nerve. Just not a real big fan of Hunt but Rune my boy Rune was there for me, and I just, I really, really enjoyed this. I liked the conclusion of this book. I think that it leaves room if she wants to continue on with them, she can, but if she wants to say that, you know, Crescent City is done, I think that it was wrapped up really, really well. I do recommend this. So as a whole, for the Crescent City series, I do highly recommend. I mean, Sarah J. Mass is just going to be one of those authors for me. It can be cliche. I know she's divisive. But I love her. I love her. I continued on on the kick with the new releases, and after that I picked up Bride by Allie Hazelwood. This is her introduction to paranormal romance. I was really apprehensive going into this one because I'm used to her contemporary, like, steminist uh, romances, but this was great. I ended up giving this four out of five stars. In this story, we're following Misery, who is a vampire, and Lo, which is the alpha for the werewolf. So in this world, there's kind of like three species. You have the vampires, the werewolves, and the humans. And in order for them to stay in peace, um, they basically send like one individual from the uh, species to live with another group as collateral. So um, Misery was the collateral for the vampires and she grew up with the humans. So she's a terrible vampire. Like she doesn't understand their culture. She doesn't really do and enjoy what vampires do and enjoy. She's more human-like. Um, and what I also like about this book is that it is more of an urban fantasy. So even though we have these vampires and werewolves and humans, they're existing in the modern world. So they have cell phones, they have jobs, they, you know, have technology and things like that. So they enjoy the things that we enjoy. But when Misery returns back to being with the vampires, she realizes that her father has actually arranged for her to marry a werewolf, which is the new alpha, and she's not excited. Listen, she's very disappointed because the last time that they tried to do this, have a wedding between vampires and werewolves, it ended in disaster. Like, it was just a bloodbath. So she's definitely nervous on her wedding day when she meets Lo. But to her surprise, like, he's not so bad. Um, and she goes to live with them, and he's very accommodating for her. He's a little put off by her. But she thinks it's just because, you know, cultural differences. Um, but as they continue to interact with each other, they end up being allies. Because she's also trying to solve a mystery of her missing friend. And Lo ends up helping her kind of investigate and figure out what happened. This was great. <laughs> Listen. These two, Low and Misery, their spice is great. It's great. Who knew? Like, I've never been a vampire girl. I just never hopped on that train. 
Uh, but Allie Hazelwood made it sexy. She did. Um, there was one part uh, when it came to the werewolves that I'm not quite sure how I feel about it. Um, it definitely wasn't like my thing, but I wasn't against it. So I would definitely read it again. If you don't know what I mean, I don't want to spoil it for you, but you might want to look up kind of some of the spice that comes along with werewolves and shifters. That's all I'm going to say. Four out of five stars. Highly recommend. And I really hope that Allie Hazelwood continues to dive into this more fantasy type romance. And honestly, February is like the month of love. It's Valentine's Day. So I continued on with a romance kick. No wonder I had so many romances in my overall stats. Huh. But from there, I picked up Butcher and Blackbird by Bryn Weaver. This is a dark romance, and it's a spice that dark romance, and I absolutely loved it. It was fantastic. Highly recommend the audiobook. I did this um, physical and with the audiobook. The audiobook, the audiobook is recorded in duet, so instead of having like dual narrators per chapter, it's an inner like exchange between the dialogue, so it kind of feels like you're listening to them having a conversation. And it was really great. That was my first experience with that, and I absolutely loved it. This is following two serial killers who are basically notorious, like, within, like, the serial killer realm. But both of them will only um, track down bad people. So kind of like Dexter vibes. But it starts off with Sloan, who was <laughs> in the process of catching another bad guy and, like, doing her thing. But she kind of gets locked in his like lair and Rowan is there to actually get the bad guy and stumbles upon Sloane and rescues her and he immediately recognized her as Blackbird and they basically create this friendship and they make this game where every year they will basically compete to get their next target and it's kind of a way to have bragging rights and a brave for them to reconnect every year. And a romance obviously evolves from there. This was funny. This was quirky. It's nothing like I've ever read before. Um, it was gory, so check your trigger warnings. But oh, the spice in this one. Uh, Miss Bryn Weaver. I like what you did there. I highly recommend Butcher and Blackbird. Um, but again, check your trigger warnings on this book because it has almost all of them. Continuing on with my romance kick, I picked up Seven Days in June by Tia Williams and I loved this book. I ended up giving it a four out of five stars. This is a contemporary romance following Eva and Shane. Eva and Shane are both authors. Eva is this like erotica romance author who has been writing this beloved series for many, many years. Shane is more of a contemporary author. Um, and when they were younger, they had this whirlwind romance that ended abruptly. And many, many years later, they run back into each other and they reconnect. And they basically have seven days to kind of figure out what happened between them and if they want to pursue another relationship. And this was just a beautifully written book that really dives into the dynamics between two people and relationships and romance and race. And it was just absolutely fantastic. I just, I recommend absolutely beautiful. And I'm definitely going to be picking up more things from Tia Williams. I mean, February is for romance. So why not keep going? Which I did. And I picked up The Right Move by Liz Tom Forty. <sighs> Five stars. Are you surprised? Are you surprised? Because I'm not. Ryan Shea? I mean, I think my only disappointment in this book is that Ryan Shea is not a real person. And that no, there's someone, there, like, that, 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 there's no one out there that can have him. Like, I, I mean, I'm married, I'm taken. But that's not fair to the world that Ryan Shea is not... It's not here because he's, I love him. I love him. Let me get back to this. Okay, so this is the second book in the Windy City series. This is following Ryan Shea, and we're also following Indigo or Indy, who is the flight attendant for the hockey team that is in Chicago. But Ryan plays for the NBA team for Chicago. That was like such a, like a weird way of explaining the dynamic in this book. Ryan, professional NBA player in Chicago. Indy, she is a flight attendant for the hockey team in Chicago. 
Andy is best friends with Ryan's sister. Andy is recently going through a breakup and needs a place to stay, and so she moves in with Ryan. Uh, first of all, he really wasn't about it, but he was doing a favor to his sister, um, and she just, you know, needed somewhere to stay and get over her breakup. Well, Ryan kind of struggles with having a social life and separating his professional life with his personal life. And so he really wants to prove to his coach, his manager, and his team that he can find a balance. So he strikes up a deal with Indy to be his fake girlfriend. So we've got fake dating happening, which I absolutely love. But with all fake dating relationships, they tend to evolve into a real one. And this girl knows how to write it right. Oh, she knows how to write fake dating so well. Relationship dynamics, real characters, real conflicts that make sense, like communication between people that, you know, healthy adults, or just adults, not even that they're healthy, but they're adults and they can have conversations. And it just, I love it so much. This was just so good. And I don't know if I will find a book that this woman writes that I don't absolutely love. So five out of five stars, highly recommend. If you haven't started the Windy City series, please do it and enjoy it with me and tell me all about it. I was riding high. I was riding high after the right move and I didn't want to pick up another romance because I knew it wasn't going to live up to what I had just read. So I decided to go with a thriller and I picked up The Locked Door by Frida McFadden. This one just fell short. It was a two for me. So I feel like the premise of this book was really promising. Following Nora, whose father was a convicted serial killer, um, and he was convicted when she was like a young preteen, like maybe 12. But we're following her as an adult now, and she's starting to kind of like relive some of the weird instances that were happening when her father was active. Women start to go missing and they're kind of having the same signature mark as what Nora's father was doing. These victims were also prior patients of her. So she becomes the main suspect in this murder. And now as I'm talking about this even more, the twist at the end is even more obvious. I'm getting ahead of myself. So basically, we're trying to figure out if Nora is in fact responsible for these murders, or is there a copycat? What is happening? I think the author does a good job maybe kind of leading you to believe one thing, and it might not be what we expect. And I feel like for me, it was didn't take me long to kind of pick up on what she was trying to do. I think we were trying to be led in one direction, but obviously it wouldn't make sense. Like we, we shouldn't be told from the bat, like that's where we're going. So there was a couple of other characters that were a little bit more of like red herrings, but I picked up pretty quickly who was responsible. And I was a little disappointed. I was very, actually, I was very disappointed. The characters just felt very surface level. Um, I feel like she tried to dive a little deeper with Nora um, but even that was was a little surface level. Um, like I said, the plot was, I think she was trying to make it convoluted and confusing so that the big twist at the end was, you know, oh my gosh. Um, but it wasn't really that surprising to me. So overall, I just really didn't enjoy it. I think it had potential, but I think it just needed a little bit more um, work. <laughs> I don't know how to say that without sounding rude. I just needed it to be a little more fleshed out and a little more thought through um, and just executed a little differently. So I ended up giving it a two out of five stars. From there, I read a classic because of my TBR game. And you know, I had a great time. So I read 1984 by George Orwell. This book is something that, I mean, this book is a classic. I feel like most people have to read this in high school. Um, and I did, but I honestly forgot so much um, that I really enjoyed reading it for, for me, it felt like the first time. Um, so this is following Winston, who lives in this really awful society called Oceana, and it's this totalitarian government that has this overarching, like, omnipresent big brother that's always watching, and Winston works for the Ministry of Truth, which basically, like, rewrites records for the, um, the party and kind of writes it in the way that they currently feel. And so it's very censored and 
not honest at all for it being the ministry of truth. And so Winston doesn't agree with the government. He doesn't agree with his society and he wants to rebel. So we're just following his journey as he tries to rebel and overthrow this government. And it's creepy as hell. It's creepy as hell because there's things, this was like written in the 50s, and there's things that George Orwell hits on that happen today in our society. So for me, that's what makes it just like chilling that, you know, we kind of have this warning, um, but we're just moving closer and closer to this, this similar society. Um, I gave it a four out of five. I highly recommend this. Um, if you haven't read it and if you're looking for like a cool dystopian, 1984 is it. All right, so then I picked up A Discovery of Witches by Deborah Harkness. This is the first book of the All Souls trilogy um, and I ended up giving this a four out of five stars. This is following Diana who is a witch that doesn't really want to be a witch. She has a rough history with her magic. Um, she lost her parents at a very young age. So she decided to kind of dive into the world of academics. And so she likes to study alchemy. While she's doing her latest alchemy research, she pulls out this manuscript, this Ashmole 782, um, which basically opens up a can of worms, like literally opens up Pandora's box. Um, and so all of these creatures, the witches, the vampires, the demons are trying to get a hold of this manuscript because they believe it has the answers to basically everyone's origin. Where does the vampires come from? Where do the um, witches and the demons actually originate from? But she is the only one that's able to actually call up this manuscript. That gets the attention of Matthew Claremont, who is a vampire, who decides to team up and work with Diana to get these answers and really just help her come into her own. Um, and I really, really liked it. This was a great fantasy romance, but I think that my favorite part about this book was the blending of the science with the magic. I love anything regarding science and especially um, biochemistry. So Matthew's latest kind of venture is in biochemical studies and to see and read about the intertwining of DNA sequencing with like magical creatures was so interesting to me and I just wanted to read more of that. Um, for me, the relationship between Diana and Matthew was a little bit lackluster. I feel like as the story, I would hope as the um, whole entire series goes on that their relationship becomes a little more developed and relatable. It just felt very insta-lovey to me. It went from like, I don't like him to now like I love him and I will sacrifice the world for him. And I just kind of missed, missed when that happened. It just kind of happened like from one chapter to the next. I was very confused by that. But I hope that their relationship kind of develops a little bit more as the series goes on. I will definitely be continuing with the All Souls trilogy. Four out of five stars, highly recommend. And I finished the month of February with a bang by reading Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. Five out of five stars, absolutely loved this book. We're following Tress, who lives in this world where um, there she's like in a port city, but instead of an ocean, it is full of these spores that when wet will like just spontaneously generate life. So they can be very dangerous and deadly. And she lives in this port city where people don't really travel in and out unless they have um, permission to do so. And she's really content with her life. She has this job of washing windows and she likes to collect these little antique cups. And she's kind of formed this relationship and friendship with the governor's son who likes to pretend that he's not actually like anybody of importance, but she knows that he is. Um, unfortunately, he is shipped off to um, basically be married out um, and she is devastated. And when they return without him, she wants to figure out what happened. And she decides that she's going to go on an adventure. She's going to step out of her comfort zone to go find the love of her life and her best friend. Um, this is just so great and whimsical. Honestly, it felt like I was reading or watching The Princess Bride. The way that Brandon Sanderson wrote this book, it just felt like a fairy tale. It felt like you're being told the story, and especially in that same type of tone of 
Um, our narrator is a small character of the story, and you're just being told this like a bedtime story, and it was whimsical, and it was beautiful, and it was funny, and quirky, and Tress was absolutely amazing. <sighs> five out of five stars. I think this is probably going to be one of my top reads of the year. Finally, we are on to the month of March. In the month of March, I read a total of seven books, um, and I think overall it was a okay reading month. So in the month of March I decided to participate in the middle grade March readathon. Basically it is a readathon to um, encourage middle grade readers and people to read more middle grade novels. So I read a total of four middle grade books in the month of March. I started with Small Spaces by Katherine Arden. I gave this three out of five stars. This is a middle grade horror. We're following Ollie who has recently lost her mother and is living with her father and she's just really starting to withdraw from her life. She's not really motivated in school. She's not really motivated to make friends. And she's really just struggling. And so after a tough day at school, Ollie just kind of runs out and she greets this woman that's near this like river or stream who doesn't seem to be in her right mind and she's really trying to get rid of this book, this like journal. And Ollie stops her and she's like, hey, like, you will not be throwing a book in the river in my presence. I am a reader. I will take it. You can donate it. And the woman's like, no, I have to do this. Ollie basically like steals the book and like runs away from this woman and she starts to read it. Well, this book is this like journal of this woman who inherits this farmland and brings on people onto her land to help work the land. Two brothers end up falling for this woman. She decides to marry the first or the older brother and the younger brother gets very upset and runs off. Well, the older brother goes after him, comes back, says that he's made this deal with the smiling man to bring back his missing brother. And from there, he's never really the same. So Ollie is very intrigued by this story. At the same time, her school is going on a field trip to a farm, and when she gets there, lo and behold, the owner of the farm is this woman that is getting rid of this journal. From there, some really creepy things start to happen, and Ollie teams up with two of her classmates, Coco and Brian, to basically save everyone of the school and escape this very, very creepy farm. I really enjoyed this book. Again, I gave it a three out of five stars. It was creepy in the middle grade sense. I really enjoyed the exploration of grieving and making friends and trying to move on with your life after a great loss. Um, overall, I would recommend reading this. I do want to continue on with this series. I think the next one is called Dead Voices. Um, I really enjoyed Katherine Arden's writing and I really enjoyed her middle grade debut. So it's a part of Middle Grade March. One of the prompts was to read a book that you felt like you missed out on, whether that is a current middle grade book or something that was popular when you were a kid. So I decided to pick up The Bad Beginning. This is the first book in the series of, of Unfortunate Events by Lemony Snicket. I never read this. I had friends that read this and loved the series. I just kind of missed that train, I guess. I just, for whatever reason, as a kid, never picked it up and never picked it up until just now. I ended up giving this also a three out of five stars. It was just okay. I think it's a great introduction to the series. There was just some themes in this book that I wasn't quite okay with. Um, and the tone of the writing for me was very juvenile, which makes sense for the intended audience. Um, but for me, I didn't get the same amount of enjoyment as I typically do with middle grade books. This is following the Baudelaire siblings. Um, there's three of them. They've recently been orphaned and they basically go to stay with this like distant relative who is not a great guy. There's scheming in this plot to steal their fortune. And like I said, I think it's a great introduction to a potentially really good series. So I'll probably continue on with it. But as the first book alone, it was just Okay, so one of the other prompts for the readathon was to read a immigrant or refugee story. So I picked up A Long Walk to Water by Linda Sue Park. This is a story that is a dual timeline set in Sudan. We're in the current time we're following Naya, whose job is to walk several miles back and forth to get water for her family and her village. And we're also following Salva, who is a young boy in the 80s um, who is fleeing from the civil war in the Sudan. Uh, this book. This book was so good. It was short, 
but it was poignant. It was to the point. Um, and the way that the two stories overlap and come together. Um, but I really, really enjoyed reading from Salva's storyline and his point of view and just the struggles that he went through as he was escaping such a terrible time. And we, you know, we see um, him grieving, but we also see signs of hope and how he's able to return back to his home and help the people around him. This was such an amazing story that I just want to hear more about them. I want to see if Salva himself, this is based on true story, um, and I want to see if Salva himself has put out anything um, on more of an in-depth look at his story and his impact in the world. So I highly recommend reading A Long Walk to Water. It's a very, very important story that I gave five out of five stars. So for my last book for middle grade March, I read Blended by Sharon M. Draper. I ended up giving this a four out of five stars. I really enjoyed this little contemporary story. We're following Isabella, who is biracial. Her mother is white, her father is African American, but also her parents are divorced. And so we're, it's actually told in like perspective of mom's week versus dad's week. And it's just her story of what it means to be a child of divorce, but also a biracial child and just her moving through that, that space. And I really just love the story. And I resonated this as being someone who's biracial with white, a white mother and an African American father. Um, just not knowing where you fit in with society was something that I struggled with as a child, um, but also a child of divorce. Now I was older when my parents divorced, but some of those same feelings were there. So I really, really enjoyed this and what she did with the story. I think that she did it in a way that is very accessible and impactful to the intended audience. So I highly recommend this book. After that, I read Broken Bonds by Jay Bree. Ended up giving this a two out of five stars. This one was this one was not it for me. So this story was very interesting and I still feel very confused about the plot. <laughs> what I can take from this and what I can tell you, um, we're following Ollie and Ollie lives in this world where you have your bonded mates. Like you can, I think do like a DNA profile and it shows you who you will be bonded to. You could be the center of the bond or you could be a part of a bond. Um, and Ollie is the center of a bond of, I think there's four. Four men that are bonded to Ollie. Um, unfortunately, Ollie has gone through a hard time. Her mother was a central bond and she was raised within the society, but she loses them very tragically and for whatever reason decides that she does not want to participate in this bonded tradition. Now the problem is, is that when you and your bond do the do, um, powers, magical powers are like enhanced. So she's basically being hunted down because her bonded are like very high profile men, very rich, and they want more power and they need her in order to access that. So the story starts with them literally like sending like a squad to go get her and bring her and put a tracker in her so that she has to eventually like give in to this bond. Um, and she's not happy about that. Rightfully so. Uh, but they decide that they're going to send her to college because she's like 19. Again, we have like these very young women who are supposed to be bonded to these older men. But you know, you do you. But anyway, they send her to college and she's very rebellious, doesn't really want to be involved in that. But she keeps referencing that she like can't. Like she can't do it because she has a secret power that she can't let anybody know, not even her bonded. Um, and that's basically the story. Her rebelling, her resisting, she's got some bonds that are pretty pretty big assholes. Um, she's got one that seems pretty nice that she's developing a bond with. Um, but these, these people start disappearing, and I think it's like because of this resistance. But that's where it gets confusing. It's like, are people resisting this bonded culture? Or like is something else happening that we're not being told? So here's the deal. I don't think this book was meant to be written for the plot. I think this book was meant to be written for some spicy entertainment, if you get my drift. But my problem is, is there was no spice in this book. There was like one borderline assault, borderline spice. I don't know how to feel about that scene. And if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I mean. 
Um, but other than that, there wasn't any like clear consensual spice in this story. And that's what I kept waiting for. So I was like drudging through this like plot that just was non-existent to try and get to at least some entertainment. And I didn't even get that. I got some hope. And, you know, I don't mind a slow burn, but the banter wasn't really there either. Like, this girl does not want to be here, and she's very clear about that. Um, but then in her mind, she's like, mm, but they do look nice, and my, and my bond is, like, pooling towards them. Like, just give in then. Give in then. Because what else, why, why else are we here? That sounds really ugly of me, and I apologize. Um, but I do know that there are, like, tons of books in this series, and I've been told that the spice comes, and it's actually really good. But, you know, like, you're not there for the plot. You're good for, there for the good times, you know? So I don't know if I'll continue with this. I mean, I might, like, pick it up on KU one night when I'm in bed and I'm tired and I just don't know what else to read. I feel like that's that kind of instance for me. But just this book alone was a 2 out of 5. I don't know if I can actively recommend this book. I don't think I can do that. But, you know, if I continue on with the series and I change my mind, I will definitely let you know. I decided to pick up something else that I was actually really excited to read, and that was Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies by Heather Fawcett. I ended up giving this a 4 out of 5 stars. Really, really enjoyed this one. In this story, we're following Emily, who is a academic. She likes to do research, and she really likes to focus on fairies and the fae. So she's going up to this very remote village to learn about about their little folk or what they call their fae. Um, but she's followed by her kind of academic, I wouldn't even say rival, he's just kind of like annoying and a nuisance and his name's Wendell. And she's very suspicious of him and thinks that he might be sabotaging a little bit of her research. And that's all I kind of want to say about this story. I don't want to reveal anything more. I really enjoyed this. I think the characters were interesting. I loved Emily. She really struggles with like social interactions and reading social cues and interacting with people. And sometimes she can come off a little rude but not realize it. I really liked Wendell. He kind of just seemed like a, you know, just things kind of fall in his lap. And he's successful without really having to do much. And he's just very, just like the opposite of Emily, where she's very like, we've got to do this, this, and this. She's very type A, and he is very type B. And it just makes for fun interactions between the two of them. And I really love the science and the research. And, like, the story has literal footnotes in them um, because we're reading from her journal as she's creating this encyclopedia of fairies. So... Really, really love this one. I definitely want to pick up the next one that was just recently released and continue on to read more about Emily and Wendell. And finally, I finished the month of March with a banger. With a banger, a five out of five star read, and you probably already know what it is. I read Caught Up by List on 40, and again, five stars. This one is following Kai, who is the pitcher for the Chicago baseball team, um, and he is a single dad. He is a newly single father. Um, he did not know that he had a son, and the mother showed up on his doorstep and was just like, listen, I don't want to be a part of this. I thought that I wanted to be a mother. It's not for me. You take him. Have a happy life. Peace out. So he is just a fantastic human being, and he is dedicated to raising his son alone and doing what is absolutely best for him, even if that means giving up baseball. But he is very, very talented, and the manager or the coach for his team um, doesn't want him to give up his career yet. Uh, but the problem is, is that Kai is a really, really protective father and really, really hard on anyone that tries to take care of his son. I mean, rightfully so. I get it. I can be a little overprotective sometimes too. But the coach's daughter, Miller, is currently like in between positions at the moment at her job. She is a professional baker that has a very, very successful career, but she's got some time off over the summer and plans to spend it with her father. And so the coach, her father, Miller's dad, um, proposes that Miller become a nanny for Kai. Okay, okay, so we got single dad nanny romance, loving it. Um, but Miller is not just a sweet little baker. She is sassy. She is independent. She has a mouth. She has tattoos. She has piercings. She drinks beer in the morning to celebrate with her father, right? And Kai is like, uh, no. Absolutely not, but she's willing to help out her father and therefore Kai. And it's just fantastic. I don't want to say too much more, but 
again, what can I say? This woman knows how to write people. She knows how to write a man, a man that we want, right? Like a, like a good man. And she knows how to write a female protagonist that can be definitely relatable. Like it's not just like like, they're real people. Like, they feel like real people. And I love that with each book, we're still getting a little tidbit into the previous couple's lives from the other books. Like, they're all friends. They all interact with each other. And it's, a like, occurring cameos that I just absolutely love. Again, if you have not picked up the Windy City series, please do it. She will be releasing the fourth book in the series. I think it comes out in July, and I cannot wait to see what comes next. Whew, so that's it. Those are the 24 books that I've read so far this year in January, February, and March. I hope you enjoyed this quarterly wrap-up. I think for me this is something that is a little more manageable than doing a wrap-up every single month. So let me know if you enjoyed the stats or if you would prefer to just get a month-by-month wrap-up. I'm open to either idea. Just let me some feedback down below. But also let me know some things that you've been enjoying so far this year. Drop some book recommendations down below. I'm always looking for the next read. So if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up, like, subscribe, do all the things. I hope you're having a wonderful time out there and that your day is full of good moods and good vibes. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye!